This is the last sermon that uh, I'm going to preach out of the book of Galatians. I have thoroughly enjoyed walking through the entire book with you over the last six months or so. Uh, and I, I think this is an important message because we're getting Paul's final words to the Galatian churches. And as you know, the last thing that people tell you is oftentimes the most important. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind today. The, the title of my sermon today is The Only Proper Boast and the scripture we're looking at is Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. Let me read this to us, and then we will pray together, then we'll dive into God's word together. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may, be, may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ." For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. For now on, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these final words from Paul to the Galatian churches. May his boast in the cross become our own, and may that be the central defining matter of our lives and our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I mentioned sort of in my intro, I've been preaching uh, off and on pretty regularly now for about six months, and so I think it's now time for a little confession. We know each other pretty well, and I think that we can be honest with each other, and I think it's fair to say that I like to talk about myself. Now, for those of you who know me, I don't think I'm necessarily a prideful person, but it's just part of the human condition. If you can get me talking, I'm probably going to at some point talk about myself. One of the things that I do for my my kids is I volunteer uh, for the high school band, and I'm the guy that announces the band when they come onto the field. And I like to do that because my voice gets magnified a thousand times over the, the over you know about two or three local miles. So I think that's a pretty cool thing. But you know what? We're no different. If you and I were to sit down together to have a discussion, very likely you would like to talk about yourself too. It's just part of who we are. In fact, if you want to get people to like you, get them to talk about themselves and they'll naturally find you are a very good person because you've given them a chance to talk about themselves. But if we take this a little bit further, I think if we're really honest, we'd have to admit that we'd like to boast about ourselves. Not only do we like to talk about ourselves, we like to exalt ourselves. We like to praise ourselves. If given the chance, I will make myself look good and you will try to do the same thing. It's just part of who we are. But just because it's part of who we are doesn't mean that that makes it right. We constantly teach our children, don't brag, don't uh, be braggadocious, etc. But it's part of who we are to boast and something that we've got to learn to wrestle with. But as Christians, we can do this in really weird ways. Now, if we were a person out on the street who didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, boasting would be very, very natural. But what we do is we boast, but we hide it under a thin veneer of spirituality. Now, let me prove this a couple of different ways. Think about the way that you use social media. Think about all the times that you have bragged about yourself, you have talked about how good you are, how wonderful your kids are, etc. but you put the little hashtag at the end, blessed. And by doing that, you've sanctified it. It's okay. It's okay. It's, it's obviously a sign that you, you believe that the Lord is involved in the whole process. But, but obviously, the Christian has come to the point where we have perfected what is known as the humble brag. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. I, I actually tweeted one out this morning I thought I would show to you. Uh, I had a tough time getting my sermon together this week because Chuck Swindoll kept calling me for help. But it was worth it since it turned out Matt Chandler wanted to borrow my outline too. Hashtag serving others is my game. So obviously this is uh, facetious. I wouldn't have actually tweeted this out, but you kind of see my point. We, we do things like that 
to make ourselves look good, but to make it also look as spiritual as we can. Another way that we do this is, through, is when we share praises and prayer requests with others. In fact, here's one that I, re, I, I recorded a, a little while ago uh, from a class that I attended with some adults. I, ha, I have something that's a praise and a prayer request to everybody. I want to praise God because little Johnny just got a full ride to Texas A&M, but guess what? He got one to the University of Texas too. We're so thankful that all our years of sacrifice and all of those ACT and SAT classes that he took and that year that we homeschooled him and sacrificed, all of that was so worth it. But now we need prayer because he doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know whether to take the full ride scholarship to Texas A&M or the full ride scholarship to the University of Texas. So please pray that we'll have wisdom and he'll know where to choose. I would say send him to the University of Georgia so he can become a real man, but you know, that's, uh, that's what I say. Um, but you know, you, you, you all understand exactly what I'm getting at. So in fact, if we were to do a touchdown dance for our lives, it would look like this. I did it, I did it, I did it. Oh, oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm awesome, I'm awesome, I'm awesome, I'm, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you, you know exactly what I mean. You're all laughing because you're all guilty. We're all guilty of the exact same thing. All right, so all of these histrionics are designed to, to prove a point. They expose the lie that our self-centered boasts are really designed to give any praise to God when in fact they're all about us. When we go on social media, when we uh, exalt ourselves in prayer and praise, we are showing that what we really think is important is me, myself, and I, and not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We boast because we want approval from others. But guess what? Others don't matter. In the final judgment, when you stand before the Lord, do you think he's going to ask what others thought of you? No, he's going to ask what you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his sacrifice on the cross for you. As believers, we claim to base our entire lives on what Christ has done for us, but sometimes our boasts show the reality that we're basing a lot of stuff on what we can do ourselves. So we have to learn to boast only in the proper boast. The only proper boast is in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of our salvation. It is only in him that we have any right to say anything positive about ourselves. It's only in our connection to him that we are allowed to say anything about who we are and what we have accomplished. It's only in the cross of Christ that we have any reason to speak. And so what I want to do today is to help us understand what Paul's saying here in this particular section about what it means to boast in the Lord Jesus Christ in his cross. And I want to change the way you think and talk about yourself and then I also want to change the way that we think and talk about ourselves as a church. In this particular section of the book, Paul, as I mentioned, is writing his final words to the Galatians. He spent a fair bit of time leading up to this particular section, and here's where he takes the pen from his secretary and he writes down his final closing himself, and he makes us realize exactly what is important to him and exactly what his final parting words to the church would be. He emphasizes in this particular section what we might call a theology of the cross. And he shows us both how to make that central to our lives, but also how to live it out in the way that we speak and act in the world. And so what I want to do today is to show you basically the central point of this passage, and then I want to talk through how the centrality of the cross shines throughout the entire book of Galatians. And then I want to close with an application or applications that will help us live this out in our daily lives. So here's the teaching of this particular paragraph. If you were to sum up this paragraph into a, a statement, here's what it would be. Paul's opponents boasted in the flesh, but Paul boasted in the cross. You can make an argument that everybody boasts in something. That's part of our human nature. We are finding something that is that about uh, our world, about ourselves, that we want to give praise to, that we want to exalt. And that's part of who we are as people. But the point is, are we boasting in the right things? Paul's opponents were boasting in the wrong thing. They were boasting in the flesh, 
But Paul was boasting in the cross. Let's walk very quickly and carefully through these verses to help you see that. The first two verses that I want to look at are verses 12 and 13, where Paul directs his attention to his opponents. And here's what he says about them. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. What Paul is doing here is laying bare both the the motive and the method of these false preachers. A little bit of history, I think, will help. Um, You remember that what had happened is Paul had gone to the Galatian area, and he had preached and and gained converts for Christ, established several churches, and then he moved on to a new ministry. After he left, certain Jewish preachers had come into town and proclaimed to the Galatians that Paul was kind of right, but he wasn't fully right. You do need to have faith in Christ, but you also must be circumcised. They had gotten their eye off on the sufficiency and the totality of Christ's sacrifice, and they said, in order to truly be a follower of Christ, you've got to be circumcised. That's what Abraham did. That's what Moses did. That's what our forefathers did. So that's what you've got to do. But Paul lays bare both their motive and their method. Their motive is to have a good showing in the flesh. In other words, they wanted to look good in the body. Now, the important thing to note here is that when you read the word flesh, you should think about all of the negative things that Paul mentioned back in Galatians chapter 5 about the flesh, about how the flesh wars against the spirit, about how the flesh creates negative things in our experiences, how it destroys relationships. All of the works of the flesh that you had in mind back in chapter 5, you should now understand that in reality, Paul is showing that these people are boasting in those negative things things. And so when they're pushing circumcision, which is their method, what they're doing is having a wrong motive. They're asking people to be circumcised, not ultimately to be faithful to God, but ultimately to give opportunity for their own sinful nature. Now, I think it's fair to say that Paul really knows these people better than themselves. They would not necessarily have stated their, their motives in this way, but he has laid bare what they are ultimately and actually trying to do. And then verse 13 goes a little further. It shows that they're not even consistent in what they ask the Galatians to do. It says that even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. They're not fully obedient to what they claim to be obedient to. But here's their motive again. They desire to have you circumcised uh, uh, to have, that they may boast in your flesh. In other words, they are seeking converts to circumcision so that they can put a notch in their crown, so that they can tell others, we have been faithful Jews, when they are in fact turning people away from God and not actually bringing people to God. They were pressing for circumcision so that they would look good to others. They were boasting in the problem, the flesh, not in the solution in Christ. They were boasting in the wrong thing and keeping their eyes on themselves And their boast was a dead end for everyone. The boast that they had would never bring anyone to salvation and, in fact, would turn them away. The next two verses that show us what Paul boasted in are verses 14 and 15. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. It's worthwhile at this point to remember a little bit of Paul's personal experience that helps to explain what he's referring to here. When Paul became a believer, it was because he came face to face with the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. He, before that time, could not accept a crucified Savior because that was uh, anathema to the Jews. Anyone who was cursed by hanging on a tree was cursed before God and in no way could be a savior. But when he came face to face with the risen Lord, he he was forced to recognize that that act of crucifixion on the cross was actually God's way of salvation. It was the way God demonstrated his love and his judgment at the same time. It's the way he demonstrated his righteousness and our sinfulness. And so for him to to get to that point, he had to have a fundamental change in what he understood the cross to be. 
And so instead of being something to be, uh, to be avoided, the cross became something that he instead would boast in because he recognized that in the cross, salvation was given, salvation was attained, and salvation was offered. Paul pressed for faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the cross because he knows that only faith in Christ saves. Circumcision is nothing. Paul was boasting in the solution for our sin, not in the problem of our sin. Paul was, in fact, boasting in the right thing, keeping his eyes on God. And his boast was the right path for everyone. By boasting in the cross, Paul pointed himself to the cross, he pointed others to the cross, and he exalted the message of the cross for all to hear. So the central point of this passage is an example. It's a model we see that the opponents are focusing on the flesh. They're boasting in that. They're boasting in the problem of the flesh. But Paul is, in fact, boasting in the cross. And he becomes our model, our way to think and act in terms of our own experience and the way that we speak about ourselves. So this brings up an important question, though. Why was Paul focusing on the cross as central for our salvation? Why was he focusing on the cross as opposed to Jesus' love, for example, uh, in the abstract? The cross of Jesus Christ is the center of of our salvation because without it, there is no salvation whatsoever. In the cross, love is demonstrated. In the cross, mercy is demonstrated. In the cross, justice is demonstrated. It's at the cross that everything that God needed us to know is fully and finally revealed. A few weeks ago when Dr. Mark Young was here, he preached about the cross, and he mentioned the cross as a center pole. And that was an image of how the center pole holds everything else up. Think about tents. Uh, You have to have a strong center support in order for the tent to stand up. And so the point is that the cross is that for our salvation and for our faith. Without that, there is no Christianity. There is no faith. There is no salvation. And what I wanted to do is this last message of Galatians uh, is a way to kind of wrap up the entirety of what the book is talking about. I wanted to walk through all the places that the beauty of the cross and the effect and its blessing upon us bursts forth in all its different ways. I'm going to list several different passages for you and read them to you so that you can see in toto everything that the cross is able to do. The first is this, the cross delivers us from this present evil age. Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. The cross brings justification from sin. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. The cross enables us to live to God. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. The cross enables Christ to live in us. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The cross redeems us from the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The cross brings the blessing of Abraham to all believers so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The cross makes us sons and daughters of God. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. The cross makes us heirs, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The cross redeems us so that we might receive adoption. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. The cross opens the way for the Spirit to enter our hearts. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The cross sets us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The cross enables our faith to work itself out in love. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision 
nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. The cross crucifies our sinful passions and desires. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The cross separates us from the world which is destined for judgment. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And finally, the cross brings new creation. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. The book of Galatians teaches us, Paul teaches us, the entire Bible teaches us that the cross truly is the center of our salvation. And it is the only thing that believers should ever boast in. So what's our response? How do we live in light of this particular message? How do we live in light of Paul's model to only boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's fairly straightforward. Boast only in the cross. To flesh out this application, let me give you a couple of sub-points or sub-applications that I think will be helpful. I would encourage you to choose consciously not to speak about yourself. It is very easy as a human being, it's very easy as a sinful human being to always make myself the center of attention, to speak about me, to speak about what I like, what I want, what I desire, my goals, my aspirations. There needs to come a time in a believer's life when they realize that speaking about ourselves can cross over from simply giving information to something inappropriate that does not honor the Lord. So I would encourage you to practice consciously when you have the opportunity not to speak about yourself. To use an example, let's talk again about social media. You, we all have Facebook. We all enjoy it. Think about that great thing that you got to do the other day. What's your first desire? Let me post it or else it didn't actually happen. Well, maybe we ought to think about, what's that going to do for my brother or sister in Christ who reads that? What's that going to do for the non-believer who sees that? Maybe it would be better not to speak about ourselves in such a way that we lift ourselves up. Sub, another sub-application would be when you do choose to speak about yourself, make the cross of Christ the center of what you say. In other words, when we speak about who we are, when we speak about what we have accomplished, when we speak about our goals and aspirations, if we do not reference the cross of Christ, we are not speaking about him properly. We must make the cross of Christ our message, our voice, our, our aim in our conversations. And when we can do that, we will be truly boasting in the cross because we will have, have lived out our recognition that the cross is the only thing that gives our lives value. And so I would encourage you to bring the cross regularly into your conversations. When you talk with your neighbors, when you talk with your friends, your coworkers, your relatives, and you're talking about your, your goals, your dreams, your aspirations, mention the cross of Christ. Mention how our salvation is found there, how you have found salvation there, how it is only there that anyone can find meaning, can find sustenance, can find life. And I realize that this is hard. As you're thinking this, I'm thinking the same thing. How, how can I do that on a regular basis? But it illustrates the truth of another passage that Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 1, through 24. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Think about it this way. When you speak about the cross publicly, when you speak about the cross to your friend, to your neighbor, to your coworker, to your relative, you are portraying the power of God and the wisdom of God so that those who are called may fully and totally respond. By speaking of the cross, we become God's instruments to minister and to share the gospel with a lost and dying world, and we become his instruments of salvation to bring people to faith. What I'd like to do is to close by thinking about this in the context of us as a church. In the past, there were certain things that we boasted about regarding about who we are as a church. 
For example, we claimed to be a praying church. We claim to be an equipping church. We claim to be an evangelistic church. We claim to be a missions church. And in some sense, all of those things are true. But this time of transition and difficulty has brought to light some deficiencies in those boasts, where we have to acknowledge that we have not been praying as we proclaimed. We have not been equipping as we desired. We have not been evangelizing as we wish, and we have not been focused on missions like we should. And so what I would like to do is to, to encourage us to let our boast about who we are as a church be focused on the cross of Christ. Because when we boast in the cross, we will pray because we realize that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. When we boast in the cross, we will equip believers because we will see our exalted Lord Jesus Christ as our resurrected and risen head who stands available to help us and guide us and to make us into the people he desires us to be. When we boast in the cross, we will share the gospel because we will recognize that it is only at the foot of the cross that salvation is attained. And when we boast in the cross, we will be involved in missions because we will recognize that the goal of the cross is for the entire world, every person, every people group, every tribe, language, and nation to see the sacrifice and love that was portrayed there, to recognize their sinfulness, and to ultimately turn to Christ in faith. If you look behind me, you will see a cross on our church wall. It's so easy to walk into this room and forget it's there. But it is the center of our, of our sanctuary. It should be the center of our attention when we're in this room, and it should be the attention of who we are as a church. Let us boast only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may we become the people that the cross desires us to be. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made there for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that the cross embodies love and justice, mercy and sinfulness. It shows that you are great and holy and good, and we are sinful and lost and depraved. But by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, we can have a relationship with you Lord, let that be our boast, that the only good thing about us is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross. And may that become our word to our neighbor, our Facebook post about ourselves, the way that we think about who we are in this world. May it be tempered by the cross, and may it point others to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.